Hey girl gang, it's Dr. Joy here and you are watching Delivering Joy MD TV. Welcome to Well Woman Wednesday where we have been talking about best life 2023, living your best life in 2023. So today I'm going to talk about a subject that might be a little sensitive for some people, but it's one that we really need to talk about as of people living in this day and age, and especially as women. So I've got a wonderful guest who's going to talk to us today about obesity and weight loss. Make sure you keep watching. All right, girl gang, we're back. And I have my classmate, my medical school classmate, a member of the legendary class of 2009 at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And I am just elated to introduce Dr. Jacob Edwards. Hello, everybody. Jacob was my med school classmate. We graduated in 2009 from Morehouse School of Medicine, and he has gone on to do so many great things. And I'm absolutely excited to have you today, Dr. Jacob. So tell me a little bit about where you been since we left Morehouse? Oh my gosh, first, thank you for having me. It's so good to see you. Um, you know, it has been a minute. It is, I'm glad that you're doing such big things. I'm proud of you. I'm so um, proud of you too. I'm so proud of you too. I actually invited you on because I saw that you had a new certification in obesity medicine. And that's something that I have a real, you know, personal story about and that I'm really passionate about. So I'm so glad that we could hook up and hang out. For yeah. So um, Absolutely. what have you been doing? Where are you, are we, where are you practicing now? Yeah. So right now I'm practicing in Dothan, Alabama. I do pediatrics. Um, so generally what I do is birth from, from age birth to 24. We just created a new adolescent and young adult um, pod. And so I'm the head of that. And uh, then I've, since then I've expanded to creating an obesity medicine or a, a weight loss clinic for children and young adults. Um, and like wow. you said, I just completed my uh, obesity medicine certification. So I'm officially board certified as of last Ooh. week. That's right. That is, I, I mean, I'm just really proud of all the things that you're doing. And I think that it's really important work because, you know, now I'm seeing 13, 14, 15 year olds who um, have severe obesity um, and, you know, thinking about as they enter their childbearing years, um, it, it really compounds a lot of the risk that we see for like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol or metabolic syndrome. Um, so I think it's such important work. How did you get interested in obesity medicine? Um, well, I've always been interested in obesity since I was in residency. Um, we did projects or one of my projects was to work with um, the obesity clinic there and, and did a project with a couple of friends um, dealing with obesity in children. And then kind of throughout my um, career, once I left residency, I really just had a passion for it. I have family members who are overweight. And one of my, so my brother, my oldest brother, um, was very overweight. And one of the things that I always wanted to do was get him in healthy shape so that, you know, he could have a healthy life. And right after residency, he spent about six months with me and he lost about 120 pounds. Um, and so it's just been really, a, it's a big passion for me because I want my family to be healthy. I want, you know, people I care about to be healthy. And I really just want to share what I know or help other people achieve, um, you know, their dreams and their goals with health. You have come to the right place because on Well Woman Wednesdays, we want to try to get to our best life. So yeah, that's right. I love for you to share some things with us. Um, and I had, you know, I try to prepare and do my homework. So I had some questions I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, first of all, we hear all this stuff in the media and in the news about obesity being an epidemic. Would, would you say that that's accurate? And, and how do you think we got to this point? It is absolutely an epidemic. Right now, if you look at the statistics, you know, one in five children are overweight or obese. One in four, um, uh, no, one in three adults or a little bit more than that are obese. Um, it's got to a point where I think only two out of five young adults can qualify for the military basic training based on weight alone. Wow. And 
Yeah, yeah. So if you look at it from the standpoint of um, the entire United States, we are at a point where it's costing us about $173 billion a year um, in health related costs. Um, and it's just more than, you know, more than money. People are dying from it. We're getting higher rates of diabetes. We're getting higher rates of heart disease, um, elevated cholesterol, which leads to strokes. Um, so it affects so many parts of our lives that it's definitely an epidemic that we have to um, try and fix. Now, how do we get there? It's been a slow build. Um, you know, life has gotten more convenient than it was back in the day. And so we are inundated with so much processed food, convenient food. It's easy to grab, stop by McDonald's on the way home. Um, going out to eat is a lot more affordable. Your schedules get busy. People don't have as much time to spend at home to eat from the TVs. And our life has gotten a lot more sedentary. So we just don't move around as much as we used to. Go anywhere. I could just get everything I need from my phone. That's exactly right. That's right. That's right. Um, you just sit and you scroll or you can Amazon is my best friend, you know. If you look at, let's say, in Dothan or maybe in LaGrange, um, I'm not sure how it is there, but I know in this area, there are a lot of food deserts where people just don't have access to quality food. You know, it's a very rural area outside of Dothan. And so people have to, you know, drive several miles or to the next city to even get to a grocery store. You know, Dollar General is their closest grocery store. Um, and you know that they have limited resources for healthy food. And I think statistically across the United States, only about um, so less than half of the United States actually has a park within half a mile or a mile of their neighborhoods. Mm. And so we just don't have access to, you know, getting around and doing things like we used to. Yeah, and I think that's definitely a problem here in LaGrange and in the West Georgia area. We definitely have some food deserts, some areas where people may not have access to fresh vegetables or fresh foods, you know, and mm -hmm. that can be a real, real problem. You don't have tr reliable transportation. You get what you can walk to. Um, so that's right. you're going to be convenience stores that are full of sodas and processed foods and things that you can stick in the microwave. Um, and, you know, those things are not necessarily the healthiest. And so it's a lot of processed foods that we're eating a lot of. And, you know, down here in the South, you know, we cook, we fry everything. Deep fry uh, and, and put gravy on it. That's right. <laughs> Deep fry it, put gravy on it. That's how we've been taught to do it. That's how uh, our parents showed us how to do it. And, you know, it's kind of the culture, which is why you see higher rates of obesity, heart disease and, you know, diabetes in the South. Mm -hmm. And the, it's, I mean, the food down here is really good, but you have it's to. It's good. It's good. Like, you know? hold on. <laughs> I'm getting That's right. Hey, you know, um, because obesity is something I've struggled with my entire life, like since I was mm -hmm. small. And, um, you know, winning the battle really takes a lot of commitment um, and, and trying to make sure that you have a, a healthy eating plan and, and a, a plan to move your body and exercise that it can be difficult. People are busy. Um, resources are slim when you get outside of metropolitan cities. So I totally mm -hmm. get it. I get it. But, you know, since we're talking about obesity, how do you define obesity? I wanted you to come and talk about this because I know you have all the latest, greatest info. And I know <laughs> most of us are still using the BMI, but I've read that that might not be the best measure to um, to define obesity with. What's, what are your thoughts right. on so BMI right now is still the the basic where we start at in terms of defining it. It's technically defined as um, for adults, it's going to be a BMI of uh, 30 or higher with severe obesity being um, 40 or higher. Um, and in children, it's going to be when your BMI, your growth chart says you're greater than the 95th percentile. Um, but is BMI the best measure? It is definitely not the most accurate measure. Um, it leaves a lot because it just measures, it's just a height to weight ratio. And so it doesn't take into account, you know, muscle and it doesn't take into account um, body fat percentage. But if you look at the trend of BMI, um, you can really get a good sense of uh, 
kind of your your overall weight status. So it's not a perfect measure, but it's definitely not bad. It gives you a place to start from. I want to talk about with women because I am just big boned. Okay. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm yeah. just big boned. And so yeah. it's really, um, in, in the black community, I see this a lot. Yeah. I'll even yeah. see young ladies coming in saying, you know, Dr. Joy, I want to get on the depot. And, and they're, they could be a normal, healthy weight, but they want right. to, you know, they want to look like um, mm -hmm. Italian and Cardi B and they want all this hips and butt and, you know, they, look like they, got be, BBL. they want to be thick, you know, mm -hmm. I have to talk to them all the time and say, oh, no, honey, you're at a healthy weight. This is where you want right. to be. Um, right. and, but it's this kind of cultural thing that we have going on. And it's not just in the black community. It's across. I mean, we <laughs> see everybody wants to wants to be thick. That's right. They do. They do. Um, I see that in my clinic, too. Um, you know, they same thing with the depot. Um, and so what BMI doesn't take into account is ethnic differences very well. Um, you know, the, when it was originally created, it was a very small population in which it was first done in. And so you can't really account for ethnic and genetic differences. And there are some differences between, you know, black culture or, um, you know, Mexican or Hispanic and Hispanic culture um, and uh, your Caucasian culture. You know, there are some some variances that probably get lost in the overall uh BMI chart. Um, with that said, though, it is it does still represent a good starting point. That's easy, cheap, and done. Easy to do. Um, but where you have to start with them is you got to focus on the health part. And you know there are better measures that can measure body fat a lot better. And that's probably a more accurate and better medically re reliable measure. It's just those resources are hard to get. They're a little bit more expensive. And most people don't always have access to it. A lot, just about every kind of weight loss program you could ever go to. So I know about these body composition tests and mm -hmm. they like pinch your fat on your arm and see how much you have. And they right. put you on this body composition scale and see how much right. water, how much. Yeah. So that is a little bit involved for the, for the average person. You know, we might measure some inches, but all of that is a lot. So I can totally get why um, we pretty much stick to the BMI in our community. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to put a BMI calculator link down in the description box so that you can calculate your BMI and see where you fall on that scale. This is something I struggle with so much, Jacob. I Because and maybe it's just because of my own personal struggles. And I know how I felt going to the doctor and being told, oh, you're, you have obesity or you're obese or you're fat, you know, it makes me really sensitive about broaching this topic with me. Right. And I always try to build some sort of rapport. Like I don't ever want to just see someone for the first time and just meet them and be like, oh yeah, so what are we going to do about your weight? You want a gastric bypass? You know, so, <laughs> so I always try to like build that rapport first. And then the next time they come back, I'll have made a note. We need to discuss weight, you know, because I see people today. I saw mm -hmm. someone, you know, who, who had morbid obesity and I was just thinking, you know, going through the motions, doing my exam, but I was thinking to myself, why do I feel this angst about talking to people about their weight? Because nobody wants mm -hmm. to be accused of fat shaming, you know? And so how do you talk, especially when you're talking to mamas and daddies about their baby? Right. How right. do you start that conversation in your, in your practice? Um, so first, even when they know that they're coming in for weight, visit it is hard because they nobody wants to talk about it everybody mm -hmm. feels like you're going to come in there and you're judging them for where they are um and so the first thing i try to say to them is that you know i want you to know from the back this is a you know i'm not here to judge what you've done or how it got here and i just try to set the stage that weight or development of weight is a multifactorial thing so you your current weight is a you know, product of your environment, of some genetics that goes on with your family, you know, kind of cultural things that have gone on. It's based on how you learn to eat, how people around you have learned to eat. So, you know, there's not one thing that has led to where we are. Our goal now is to focus on getting you um, to the healthiest um, place so that you can live your best life. I usually open the conversation with, 
how comfortable are you with talking about your weight? Um, so that they can really lead how comfortable they are. And then after that, depending on how comfortable they are, I start ta by talking, you know, what makes you uncomfortable about talking about your weight? Ooh, that's, what kind of good one. You that's good. That's so, good. Yeah. Then it leads them to kind of tell me their problems or what their concerns. And then you kind of really let them lead the conversation. And then you, I can and now, once I've listened to them, tell their story or how they got to, or what, how they feel about their weight. Um, now I can say, well, here's where we are. And here's how we can help, you know, address some of those issues that you, you talked about. Really good. Starting off with the, how do you feel about talking about your weight? You know, and just asking people that and then asking, well, if you don't have a good comfort level with that, then what makes you so uncomfortable? I think that's great. So I'm definitely going to steal that. We talk a lot about diet and exercise and lifestyle modifications. You know, those are the things we're taught to to document. They certainly do play a big role in um, development of weight and obesity. Um, I have been learning that there is increasingly we're finding that this might actually have a lot to do with um, people's genetics and mm -hmm. so um, with some environmental factors that they're facing, yeah. medications, mm -hmm. um, even issues that they might have hormonally, like just uh, hormonal imbalances. So can you talk a little bit about that so that everybody who's been fighting obesity like me can feel a little bit better, like we're not just losers? <laughs> like, <laughs> dog, I can't seem to get, you know, keep my weight the way I need it. It's always right, up, right. up down. So I'm trying to be consistent this year. So that's what my best life 2023 is going to be. Right, right. That's right. Um, no, it's true. So when you think about weight and obesity um one thing you got to do is one i try to establish with the patients that i want you to think about obesity as a disease treat it like it is hypertension or diabetes because for so long you know it's been labeled as a status you know you're fat you're overweight you're obese or i have a 56 year old obese patient um but let's let's talk about it in terms of I have a you know 30 year old patient with obesity right and this is how we're going to treat this medical problem because it is a all-encompassing problem right so your genetics do play a role in it and they're doing lots more studies in the role of epigenetics and how you know where you were born the timing when you were born certain periods of the year may lead someone to have um a higher bmi or if they were born in a time where maybe their family wasn't doing so well off and there there was not as much food you know that can contribute to them uh having genes that predispose them to gaining weight easier um uh, i was born in july so what is that, is that <laughs> <laughs> i was born in, right? july, in july right. that, like yeah. a, a heavier right. like, no. that no. way. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, I don't know. We have we, we got to do some more research on that one. Uh, but no, you were saying some really good stuff. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just being silly. It is not just how much we exercise or how much we eat because we all have friends and we all know people who can eat, you know, eat us out of house and home, eat an entire pizza and lose weight the next day. And then you look at food and you gain two pounds, right? It's, it makes me so upset. Like, like Alvin... My better half, he he eats like so much. Like I've never seen a human yeah. eat as much as he eats, but he he's the same size that he was in college still. And I'm just like, how do you do this? Right. That's how you know that it is not all just um, how much you're eating uh, or eating less and exercising more. It's not an equal equation like that. Your body, the way your body interacts with food, the hormones that you produce, the way that you're um your fat interacts or your fat cells kind of interact with uh your lifestyle you know all take into account how you gain weight and for some people it is easier and for some people uh you know they will never gain weight and it is not fair definitely not all it's not your fault it is not something that you can control um we can help it you know we can address some of it but we can't we're not going to be able to change our genetics at all
That's true. So that does make me feel a little bit better. However, I also know what I ate uh, for dinner. So <laughs> <laughs> what sort of medically supervised weight loss programs are you working on with, like, say, your teens and, and yeah. young people? And do you think there's a role for surgical intervention in younger people? I was listening to a really neat podcast where this pediatrician was kind of making the case for why bariatric surgery should be an option for younger people, you know, teens or um, people in their right. you know, adolescence. The first we can start with kind of diet and exercise um, or the types of diet that I recommend. Um, in general, for both the type of diet that you're going to be on and the type of medication we might consider, you really have to find the one that works best for the patient and their family and for their lifestyle. Um, you know, both the low fat or uh, the low carb or keto diet have been out there. But honestly, the one that is most successful is the one that you can stick to, right? And so when people get Amen. hung up on, <laughs> that's right. And so you got to meet your patients where they are. And honestly, people get hung up on trying to stay with this particular type of diet, stay with this. And it doesn't really fit their lifestyle or their body um, type or, and, you know, they fall off and they gain weight back and they get discouraged. And so mostly what I focus on first is cleaning up the diet. You know, let's just get rid of as much ultra processed food as possible and, you know, um, and see what that does first. And then after that, let's see where we can make some other changes. Um, in your in your diet um and i always try to be like listen food is good i am not going to take food away from you you need food i enjoy food and at the end of the day our goal is to create a healthy balance with food um and so i don't want to be here restricting you to just you know some lettuce and water uh like most people think it's about because that's not going to get get you where you want to be um and so I do, you know, a combination of many different ones. Um, some people have great success with low fat. Some people have great success with low carb or Mediterranean diet. But what most of it is with changing your food is really taking out that ultra processed food that has a lot of additives in it, have a lot of uh, preservatives in it. Um, that's just not real food. Um, so let's start with mostly just eating whole food. And then we can go from there. That, that whole thing about shopping on the outsides of the grocery store, mm -hmm. like where you find right. produce and vegetables and things that yep. are not wrapped or packed in plastic. You know, you want yes. some real food. Um, and and I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. That, that is a major thing. And so let's but now it is hard. It is hard to convince people to start off with. So what I'll do is like, listen, we're shooting for 80, 20. Okay. 80% of the time I want you to do this. 20% of the time, I want you to have some fun because um, I can get them to stick to 80-20 easier than, you know, 100% all this. I can definitely see that. And I think that's a great idea. So the 80-20 rule will be great. And then, you know, when it comes to the point where they've cleaned up as much as they can and maybe they're mm -hmm. in an appetite suppressant or right. um, even, you know, the latest craze is Ozempic. Oh, my God, you can't. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, I know a lot of people who have been using that and been successful um, with it. But then I wonder what happens when you stop it and how do mm -hmm. you, you know, so it's still about diet and consistency. These other tools can yeah. help, but you still mm -hmm. have to, you know, eat consistently well and move. Right. So, yeah. So yeah. what do you think about about um, different um, medication options? Yeah, so medications are there to help you, like you said, assist when diet and uh, exercise may not be able to, um, you know, take care of everything. Or you're not in a place where you're able to start a hardcore exercise program, or you need to jumpstart things to see um, how things are going to go just to be encouraged enough to carry on. Um, but there are a lot of good options out there. Ozempic and the GLP-1 agonist are a new craze that everybody loves and um, they do have their place. 
but you have to be upfront with your patients about these may be lifetime medicines. These may be medicines that you can't get off of because once you come off the medication, they're the way that their hormones react with their body, the way that their genetics interplay with food is still going to be there. And right. this is just an additive to help combat that. Otherwise, you're going to come off the medicines and you may rebound higher to where you start from where you started. There are a lot of other ones like Fentramine, Adipex is an old OG medicine. Yes, that is so sure. good. Um, and they are still they're working on many different ones. Um, uh, now that uh, our combination GLP-1 or Ozempic type medications um, that will hopefully come out in the next five to, to 10 years. And you know, because um, you know, you know, I done went and tried to get me some Ozempic, right? <laughs> and yeah. um, it was like $800. Yeah, for it is. For one month supply. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just kept looking till I could find a hookup so I could get me some. But... Right, that, right. I mean, it's so out of reach price wise. Like Ozempic mm -hmm. and Dovi, price wise, it's just out of reach unless you're like mm -hmm. the Kardashians. You know, that's right. It is. Um, yeah. I wonder why more insurances don't cover these medications. Even Adipex, like it's not right. covered for most insurance mm -hmm. companies. Why do you? I mean, it just seems like it makes little sense because it would save them so much money mm -hmm. down the yeah. line versus having to pay for diabetes meds and hypertension right. meds. If you have yep. a stroke and have to be hospitalized or if you, you know, it just, it makes zero sense to me. I don't understand that at all. Yeah. Me either. Insurance is my, like, oh, it is the dread of my day. It will not cover it. Or you have to jump through a thousand hoops to cover it, um, to, to get it covered for patients. And if you're on Medicaid or Medicare, it's like nearly impossible, um, to get it done unless you, you know, call them day and you know donate your first kidney a few minutes left and i wanted to ask your opinion because my next mm -hmm. episode is going to be about bariatric surgery so i'm going to be talking to a okay. bariatric surgeon at what point do you think that people should consider bariatric surgery when you've honestly tried um management with diet and exercise and you are not making any progress and your bmi or your your weight is in a severe health status then i think it's a point where you have to have a conversation about starting bariatric or uh, considering bariatric surgery um the you know technically you can refer for a bariatric surgery if you are a bmi of like 35 or higher with significant comorbidities like diabetes or severe sleep apnea or heart disease. Um, it's not always my first option. And I think for most people, it's not my first, their first option, but it should be somewhere in the conversation that we may not be able to get to a point where we get your, your BMI to a healthy state or a quote unquote normal state. Um, through just exercise and diet or or, or medications alone. Mm -hmm. um, especially like if you're starting at a BMI of 50 or 60, you know, it's going to be hard sometimes to get to a BMI of 25 without significant intervention. Um, and so typically I refer for surgery when we've tried, we've honestly tried to change our diet. We've incorporated exercise and we're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, and we're just not making any progress. We've tried medications. It's not working. Um, and, you know, we have severe health problems or at risk for having severe health problems. Then it's time to have that conversation about bariatric surgery because the numbers don't lie with surgery. It can help. I mean, it shows a significant decrease in overall uh weight or um fat percentage um it decreases you know it can show like an 80 percent decrease in hypertension or a reduction in you know high cholesterol and it improves many different disease categories so but it is a surgery and it is a lifestyle change and you have to be ready to do it yeah, I totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jacob Edwards, for joining me. I can't wait till you move back to Georgia so we can hang out more. 
And I really appreciate you sharing all this information with my girl gang. We'll be bringing you more like this in our Best Life 2023 series. But we will see you next time, girl gang. Peace. All right, girl gang. Ha, ha, ha.